Hi there and welcome to video number four in which we'll finish this series of videos on paleobiogeography by um, looking at one example of how fossils can help us understand oceans and continents of the past. This is a thing called the Iapetus Ocean. So the Iapetus Ocean is an ocean that previously existed and does no longer and it's a really good illustration of um, one of the many ways that fossils can help us understand past continental configurations. Indeed, much of the early evidence, as I've already mentioned in the previous videos, um, for continental drift was based on paleontological data, so fossils. And fossils remain critical to understanding continental movements in deep time. As you can see from the map on the left, here, the UK is made, actually made up of a series of different chunks of old continents. These are things that are called terrains in geological speak, many of which have been identified in part through the fossils that are preserved in them. To illustrate this point, we'll um, learn a tiny bit more about the Iapetus Ocean. But first, I want to quickly mention a tiny bit of history. During the 1960s, um, as plate tectonic theory was proposed as a mechanism for continental drift, and during the early stages of the plate tectonic revolution, a Canadian geophysicist, a guy called Tuzo Wilson, predicted that the remains of an ancient, ancient seaway would be found in the lower Paleozoic rocks of the Northern Hemisphere. So Wilson used as evidence to support this North American and European fossil assemblages, so assemblages of brachiopods, trilobite, and graptolite species. And he showed that these were separated by a major suture that runs along the length of the modern Appalachian and Caledonian mountain belt. Um, so you can see um, this suture of this ancient now closed ocean um, running throughout uh, modern day Scandinavia, UK and North America. This allowed Wilson to infer the existence of an old ocean, a thing called the Proto-Atlantic, which we now call Iapetus. And he made the argument at this time that this ancient ocean separated North America and these tiny bits of Europe um, up here from the remainder of what is now the European continent. Um, until there was a collision of these continents and an oceanic closure that happened in the Silurian and the Devonian periods. So I'm going to give a quick introduction to this over the course of this video, um, but I will do so focusing on the fossils. Bear in mind that evidence from fossils is supplemented um, by, uh, for example, evidence from paleomagnetism, uh, rock facies, uh, glacial lithologies, and lithologies, so rocks associated with mantle plumes. All of these lines of evidence have been used to build the picture that I'm about to be showing you, despite the fact that my focus will be on the fossils. I'll start by giving you a very quick overview of the, of the history of this ocean as a whole before diving into a bit more detail with my next couple of slides. The Iapetus Ocean um, <clears throat> is shown on this uh, paleogeographic reconstruction from 540 million years ago. You can see it here between an ancient continent called Baltica and an ancient one called Laurentia. More on that in the next slide. Um, this Iapetus Ocean actually first opened during the late Precambrian. Um, it followed the breakup of a supercontinent called Rodinia. Um, it developed throughout the Cambrian and reached its widest extent in the late Cambrian, a little bit after this paleogeographic reconstruction here. Um, it extended as much as 4,000 kilometers across at its widest. We can surmise this because only um, pelagic taxa, in this case uh, floating graptolites, were similar on both sides of this ancient ocean. But then over the next tens to hundreds of millions of years, this ocean closed. First we see swimming organisms. For example, there's a group of um, organisms that are closely related to modern day vertebrates called the conodonts that could cross this seaway. And later, um, we start seeing both the mobile and eventually the sessile or fixed benthic communities of this time that include trilobites and brachiopods crossing this seaway as it got narrower and narrower. Indeed, by the late Silurian, as the Iapetus narrowed to only a few hundred kilometers, we start seeing even tiny creatures like the um, benthic, so that's um, seafloor dwelling ostracods. These are really tiny crustaceans that don't really travel um, that far. We see them managing to cross this ocean by the late Silurian. 
and by the Devonian, the ocean was almost completely closed and freshwater fishes were similar in both Europe and North America. Um, so basically this has created a single continental mass by that time period. So that's a nice story. How can we use the fossils to unravel that story a bit more? And what do they tell us about this series of events? Well, the fossils allow us to actually um, show in quite a bit more detail um, beyond the mere existence of this ocean, what different continents were doing during different periods of geological history. And this is a story that's often told in terms of a three plate model. Um, within this model, we have um, oceans separating three continents, each of which is associated with a plate. These continents are called Gondwana. This is a, a continent that was just around uh, and touching the South Pole at this time. And two northern continents called Baltica and Laurentia. So those are three of our plates that were around at this time. And then there was a, a, another small um, bit of continental crust uh, called Avalonia. Um, you can see which is labeled on this map here. Now this Avalonia broke away from Gondwana during the late Cambrian to the all earliest Ordovician period and together with Baltica, shown here, um, headed north towards Laurentia. And we can tell that because it's a picture that's built up from faunal provinces. So on this image on the left-hand side here, you can see some examples of early Ordovician trilobite zones. So you can see there's a Mediterranean province called a um, Calaminacean or Dalaminatician. Oof, there's a lot of long words in this one, I'm afraid. Basically, black circles shown here. Um, which occupied the continental shelves around the higher latitudes of the massive southern continent of Gondwana. We can also identify a Baltic province, otherwise known as the Megistinaspid um, province. These are the uh, light blue or cyan squares here, which are associated with um, Baltica and are nowadays found largely in northwestern Europe. Um, and this was at temperate southerly latitudes. Oceans in the lowest equatorial latitudes hosted two distinct and separate faunal provinces. The first is the Bathurid province. These are the red stars that are shown on this map here, uh, Laurentia and Siberia and bits of China. And a separate Dicelocephalinid province, oh, that one was difficult, um, which colonized the seas surrounding the margins of the lower latitude parts of Gondwana. So you can see those here. So this series of different um, associated species of trilobites um, kind of mark out provinces, each of which is associated with a different continent during this time period, some 480 million years ago. The fact that we've got two different provinces at the same paleo latitude indicates that the ocean separating Laurentia, Siberia and North China, i.e. these red star continents, um, and that large sector of Gondwana, where we've got these um, yellow triangles, must have been large enough to have prevented the trilobite larvae from successfully crossing them. So these oceans here were probably smaller than this one here, is what we think. Provinces such as these are also reflected in the brachiopod fauna um, that we have from around this time. So this is shown on the right hand side here, and you can see that we've again got four, um, five, and indeed maybe even six different provinces in this time in our brachiopod populations. So we can get really a good level of detail. We know, go further than that though, we know there were also islands in the Iapetus Ocean, um, which were identified through peculiar faunas which we don't see elsewhere. Uh, so these are um, shown in the, the top left here, 480 million years ago. Each one of these little um, islands uh, shown um, moving northwards as the um, as time progresses is marked with its own little label. And so what we think happened based on the fossils is that Baltica uh, moved northwards and as it did so, um, it spun anti-clockwise, moving towards the equator and picking up these various terrains um, on the edge of its continent. So between 460 and 440 million years ago, all these little spits of land with their own fossils smashed into Baltica as you can see occurring by 440 million years ago. Uh, so by the late Silurian um, shown here, uh, you can see that these continents had docked to formula Russia, this big northern continent. 
By the Devonian period, faunal provincialization had reduced in trilobites because this group was less diverse. Um, but in contrast, the brachiopods had greatly radiated. So Devonian provinces that help us understand the further evolution of this ocean um, are largely based on the brachiopods. After this point, shown in the late Silurian, eventually Gondwana and La Russia collided to form Pangaea, that supercontinent upon which the dinosaurs ultimately lived. And that's, that's a cool story, right? We can say a really impressive amount of things from the um, uh, fossil communities that we find associated with these ancient current, current ancient continents. But we can go a step further and reconstructions of the Iapetus ocean system have, all, have even allowed us to start mapping ocean currents and upwelling zones. So I've put an example of this on the right hand side here that was created using a general circulation computer model based on paleogeographic maps. In this um, kind of um, this model of the ocean at this time, red and blue arrows represent warm and cold currents, respectively. All of this aids our understanding of possible migration routes of some key fossil groups during this time period. But those currents may, of course, impact on the distribution that we're seeing in the fossil record of these organisms. For example, the distribution of low latitude um, warm fauna may have been influenced by strong and persistent warm ocean currents. So that's another thing we have to bear in mind when we're trying to better understand what was going on in deep time. So in summary, to reiterate, the early Paleozoic um, biogeography that I've just shown you builds on an analysis of trilobite and sessile brachiopod distributions. Sessile means attached to the seafloor. Um, these are an example of our success and as these diagrams show, so for example, this is lower Ordovician to middle Silurian in terms of the changes in, um, uh, uh, in trilobite communities. And on the right hand side, we can see a series of Ordovician um, changes in terms of the diversity of different brachiopod groups. As you can see from those, um, communities change in time as well as space. And as you can imagine with this kind of dynamic, it's, it gets very complicated very quickly. There are lots of different factors we have to consider, including climatic changes, uh, as well as the space, as we're looking at paleobiogeography. And a key question then is, if we're using these fossils as a tool to understand biogeography in the past, are all fossils as good as each other for biogeographic analysis, or do we have bad and good fossils when it comes to biogeography? As a living example of a good um, organism for biogeographic analysis, the polar bear would be a very good example because it has an obvious and well-defined biogeographic range. That's not true of all organisms today, and it's certainly not true of all fossil organisms. And a number of key conditions must be satisfied if fossil data are to be effective when describing past um, geographies. For example, we almost always need to know the precise age and ideally the lifestyle of organisms um, in order to help us use them as tools for building uh, biogeography. In terms of organisms that are planktonic, pelagic or nectonic, i.e. those that float or swim, um, those will have a distribution that's controlled by the movement and the temperature of water masses. As such, they may be of latitudinal significance, i.e. we find them in belts, but they will usually not be related to particular terrains. So a terrain being a fragment or block of continental crust with its own individual geological history. Rather, we see those terrains within benthic organisms or those that swim near the bottom. So these are organisms that are living on the seafloor or just above it. Um, we see uh, indeed uh, within these communities um, provinces associated with domains at shallow depths, but with increasing depth, these generally um, become, these organisms become more cosmopolitan. So that's because conditions at depth are generally more uniform with regards to temperature and substrate than in shallow water. So there's less provincialism as a result. Exceptions do exist, especially within deeper ocean regions. But these are all considerations we have to factor in to paleobiogeographic continental reconstructions. And when we're building these reconstructions, these analyses, we need to be aware of the ecology of the organisms that we're looking at. And we need to compare fossils with similar lifestyles and from similar facies, 
so um, found in similar kinds of rock, um, to try and exclude ecological and environmental effects as we're considering our paleobiogeography. And that brings me to the end of my example that's based on the Iapetus Ocean. I will be um, featuring a few more slides as part of our Zoom session, looking at patterns of biodiversity and taking those into deep time. So that's another element of paleobiogeography. But until then, I hope you have a good week and I look forward to seeing you on Monday for our paleobiogeography Zoom. See you soon.